good afternoon or possibly good morning, to, depending on where you are listening to us from today. But I want to welcome everyone to our webinar today on investing in tax liens with a self-directed IRA. Here at Advanta, we like to bring in guest speakers on a number of different topics. And today we are happy to be joined by someone who's going to talk to us specifically about how to invest in tax liens and really giving us some really good information a good overview on exactly what tax liens are. Uh, my name is Scott Mauer. I'm with Vanta IRA. I've been the director of business development. I've been with the company now for almost 12 years, coming up 12 years uh, early part of next year. Uh, during my time at Advanta, I've taught a lot of classes, I've done a lot of educational work, and I've also handled a lot of uh, different transactions. And over the years, we certainly have had a few people uh, here and there ask about and then ultimately invest in tax liens. And so we thought it would be a great um, great chance for everyone to learn from someone who's actually done it. So we've brought a guest on today uh, to talk about tax lien investing in particular. Just a quick disclaimer, uh, Advanta IRA, whenever we do any seminars or webinars, uh, we do not necessarily endorse any particular investment or investment strategy. Our job is to act as an administrator and a record keeper, and ultimately, uh, we don't, in that case, don't provide legal tax or investment advice. So it's important to consult with an attorney or an accountant, uh, other financial advisors, uh, before entering into any type of transaction, whether it's a tax lien or whether it's a piece of real estate or even a private placement. So um, please, you know, just just note that. Now, for anyone who's listening to the webinar live today, uh, if you have any questions uh, as we go through the presentation, either for myself or our guest please type your question into the chat box on your screen. Uh, we will get to those um, as we go through the presentation, uh, maybe either, either you know, throughout the presentation or maybe saving some time at the end. Uh, in the event we get too many questions that really to, to fit in the time, uh, either myself or the guest will reach out to you uh, to get those questions answered and, and make sure you get answers to, to what you're looking for. So again, if you're listening live, please type those questions into the chat box uh, and we'll get to them as we go. Uh, just a quick background on Advanta IRA for those of you who, who may not be familiar with us. Uh, we are a self-directed IRA administrator and record keeper, so we hold alternative assets uh, within a retirement account that you know, kind of brokerage firms and banks typically are, are not willing to do. We currently hold over $800 million in assets, over 5,000 active accounts, and we have an account manager system for all of any client that signs up with Advanta gets assigned to one particular person who will work with them regarding the, all of their transactions and all of their self-directed IRA needs. It gives you that concierge-style service to have one point of contact rather than simply calling an 800 number. Uh, as I mentioned, we're very committed as well to education uh, here at Advanta IRA. That's why we provide uh, this webinar today, uh, talking about tax lien investing. But we do a number of other webinars um, throughout the year on different topics. We do a lot of live seminars and lunch and learn, event, lunch and learn events at our offices in both Atlanta and the Tampa Bay area. In addition to our live events, we also have a lot of free uh, training that's available online on our YouTube page or also on our web page as well and our on demand. Uh, and we also a lot, a lot of times put some information out there on blogs and a lot of, also as well have guest bloggers come in and sharing their information uh, as well. Again, our uh, reason for doing all this is we want our clients to be educated on what it is that they're looking to do. It leads uh, to a much better experience for all parties, uh, us and, and the client obviously as well, to fully understand what it is that you're doing uh, with your IRA and get those questions answered. Now very quickly, I'm going to run through a few things around self-direction before I bring in uh, our guest. Um, again, for those of you who may not be familiar with what a self-directed IRA is, a self-directed IRA really is simply the ability for an individual who has money in a retirement account to invest in assets that they control and things that they might understand a little bit more intrinsically uh, than the stock market and the mutual fund market. Self-directed IRAs often acquire different types of assets, whether that's real estate, mortgages and notes, private placements, precious metal, metals, the tax liens we're going to talk about today. Uh, again, a lot of different things. It's really self-directed just simply means that the owner is in control. <clears throat> so why do people use self-directed IRAs? Uh, three of the more common reasons we see here at Advanta. Uh, for some, it's just a different source of capital. So someone who, for instance, might already invest in tax liens personally, their IRA funds just give them enough access to additional capital to purchase even more tax liens. So basically using your IRA to invest in things that you already are familiar with or you probably are already uh, investing in. 
Uh, for some clients, the, it, it, the nature of using a self-directed IRA allows them to make investments into assets and do so in a tax-free or tax-neutral environment so that the investment gains from these IRAs accrue simply back to the IRA, they're tax-free or tax-deferred depending on the type of IRA account that you have. So if you're expecting a large return, a significant gain in account uh, from an investment, it can make sense to do that investment through an IRA as well. And another reason, simply people are tired, scared, frustrated. They worry about the stock market on a daily or monthly basis. Uh, people want to be in control when a lot of people look at the stock market uh, at, at worst as a rigged game or at best sometimes just um, a luck of the draw depending on what you were invested into. Uh, being able to invest in other assets like real estate, like private placements, things that they understand and control uh, allows them to sleep a little bit uh, easier at night. Now all of these reasons, certainly we have clients uh, and potential clients who fit into mo multiple boxes of these three particular options. So. Uh, just keep in mind, you know, if you don't fit into one, you certainly probably fit into another uh, if you're listening to this webinar. Now, the types of accounts that can be self-directed, um, any type of IRA, whether it's a traditional, a Roth, a SEP, or a simple IRA, you can self-direct those monies. So if you have an account with that designation anywhere on your statement, uh, those funds can ultimately be used to self-direct. Um, also, any former employer plan. So if you work for a company, you work for the local school board, work for a local government, and you build up an employer plan like a 401k or a 403b or 457, those monies can also be rolled over into a self-directed IRA and ultimately invested into those assets uh, that we've talked about a little bit already. Now moving money between different accounts is very simple. It's either by doing a transfer or a direct rollover. It depends largely on the type of an account you're moving from and the type of an account you're moving to to determine ultimately if the money movement is a transfer or is considered a direct rollover. Regardless of which one it is, it's going to be tax-free uh, to you to move money between those accounts, and, in, and usually you can do those transfers and direct rollovers as often in whatever you'd like and also in whatever amounts you wish. It does not have to be the full amount moving from one IRA to another. You can certainly move some money from a Schwab or a Fidelity account over to Advana, move some cash from Advana back to one of those accounts. Uh, you really have that freedom and flexibility as long as you do it properly each time, and that's again something we would help you with at Advanta uh, to identify what type of an account you have and what process needs to be followed. Now I mentioned the types of accounts that uh, we had, but also the types of assets that can be purchased in a self-directed IRA. Not surprisingly, we deal a lot with real estate. Outside of the stock market, a lot of individuals and corporations in this country hold wealth and hold assets and investments in real estate, whether it's rental properties, uh, rehabs or flips, multifamily properties, uh, people investing into private notes, private mortgages, uh, or private placements. You know, it could be a, a startup company issuing stock. It could be a hedge fund or some other private equity partnership as well. Uh, mobile home parks, uh, LLCs, gold and silver, again, a lot of different things, and including what we're going to talk about here, here, just a moment uh, with our guest, is tax liens. The common thread that all of these investments have are mostly that the brokerage firms, the banks that are out there that hold a lot of retirement funds in this country, simply won't hold these types of assets. They're not willing to. Uh, for them, it doesn't fit their business model, and that's why companies like ourselves uh, exist in order to hold these types of assets. That's kind of my little spiel uh, here for the beginning. I want to bring in now uh, Chantel Owens of Wealthmore Properties, who's going to talk to us today about tax lien investing. And I just want to remind everybody who's listening live, if you have questions uh, as Chantel is talking, please type those into your chat, the chat box on your screen. I'll be monitoring those questions and, and, inter and maybe interjecting every now and then to get those questions asked of Chantel. Uh, but Chantel, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. So I'm going to turn it over to you, and uh, let's uh, learn about tax liens. Okay. Before you go, Scott, I do have a quick technical question. <laughs> sure. Sure. Um, when I, I know how to advance the slides, but if my slides have animations on the slides, is there something that I use for that? No, unfortunately, it's, that's not going to show up in the way we have it. So you'll, it'll, okay. it'll, the little slide will be there. But yeah, um, sorry about that. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, we'll work through that. Okay. Um, 
Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Chantel Owens, and I will be taking you through the in introduction to tax lien investing today. But before I get started, I'd just like to give a quick legal disclaimer. Um, the material contained in this presentation, whether verbal or written, um, does not constitute legal advice. I am not an attorney, and I cannot offer legal advice. Any information presented is from my own personal experience, and it's just meant for educational and entertainment purposes only. Please conduct your own due diligence when investing in tax liens. An attorney-client relationship is not presumed or intended by receipt or review of this presentation, and the information provided should never replace informed counsel when specific tax lien-related guidance is needed. You do not have permission to record, so please do not record. You do not have permission to reproduce, copy, or distribute this information. Please do not represent this material as your own, and all copyrights are reserved. So now that we got that out of the way, let's get started. So first of all, if you would like a copy of the slides, I'd be happy to send them to you. You can just send that right to the email address listed, 101 slides at georgiataxleanbootcamp.com. So who am I? Uh, my name is Chantel Owens, and I am a full time tax lien investor. As a matter of fact, I just left the tax commissioner's office paying for some properties that I picked up in the tax sale yesterday. So that's actually what I do full time, and I teach tax lien investing um, part time. But I started in real estate um, investing in 1999. I started as a credit investor. I was in corporate America. I was an executive assistant um, to a director of a company, and I had a coworker that came to me and said, you know, I'd like to use your credit to invest. And I was like, hmm, let me think about it. How much would something like that pay? And he said, well, I could pay you about $8,000. And at that time, I was making about 40000 and I had never seen $8,000 in one time. And I had pretty much used my credit to buy what I needed. I had a house, I had a car, you know, I had a couple credit cards, and so I really wasn't my credit. So I said, okay, I'll try. And that was in 1999. And when I made that $8,000, um, you know, I asked my colleague, um, so if I made 8000 what exactly did you make? And he said, well, I made 5000 on top of your eight. And I said, okay, um, were you the person that actually used my credit? Because I noticed from the paperwork that, you know, it had a, somebody else's name. It was a, a company's name. And he was like, well, no, I was just a middleman. And so I said, okay, well, how much did the other person make? And so, so he showed me how to read the paper, <laughs> the HUD one, and I saw that the other person had made about $100,000 off of my credit. So I said, you know what, I think I want to learn that aspect. And so I studied, got into real estate, um, studied, and then I started with actually the no money down deals, which eventually led to wholesaling, and then I started flipping, and eventually I became a landlord. Um, and so by 2001, I was full-time in real estate. I had left my job, and <clears throat> by um, – 2005, I was holding 17 rentals, and um, those rentals were cash flowing anywhere between like three to eight hundred dollars a month, and so I was doing pretty good. But then I was holding all those rentals with adjustable rate mortgage. That was the thing back then. And so that's what I was doing. Um, I eventually obtained my real estate license in 2006 just so that I could um, purchase HUD properties. And then everybody knows what happened in 2007. The market crashed, and I crashed right with it, especially holding those adjustable rate mortgages. So the uh, rates began to adjust. What the tenants um, were paying in rent did not cover the adjustments. And so 
I had to file bankruptcy in 2007. And directly after that, one of those properties, um, a friend of mine called me and said, I saw your name in the tax sale. And I said, oh, really? And so I did my research and found out that someone had bought a property that I thought the bank had foreclosed on. They did not foreclose, and that property went into a tax sale. And so from that point, I began to research the the tax sale process because when I saw what the person paid for the property that I owned and I saw that it was significantly less than what I had originally paid for it, I thought, yeah, this is what I want to do. I had a initially, uh, before filing bankruptcy, I had been searching for a way that I could quickly own real estate um, free and clear. And when that property went into the tax sale, based upon my research, I knew my, pres- my prayers had been answered. And so I got into um, tax liens by 2009, and by 2012, I was back in business full-time in real estate. So, hey, Chantel, just really quick, I want to just jump in. We had one person ask a question I want to address just up front so they know kind of as they, they review the presentation, they said, can an investment in tax liens be funded with IRA and non-IRA funds or partnered with a spouse or friend? Uh, I'll just answer that quickly. Yes, you can certainly invest in tax liens either with your IRA funds, with non-IRA funds, alongside friends. Uh, there's probably a lot of different ways you can, can structure, but I think the other thing to understand as Chantel starts talking, especially this slide right here indicates, sometimes it doesn't acquire a whole lot of capital up front. Uh, where you would need a partner. You probably, a lot of people probably have some of this money sitting in an IRA or in a non-IRA account to do it. So, um, so you go for it, just make sure anyone's listening, if you're raising your hand to ask a question, just type questions into the chat box. Unfortunately, you can't uh, unmute everybody to let questions to be asked. So please, those questions type in the box. But I should tell go on. Okay. Um, so, this property that you see on this slide, this was my silver lining after bankruptcy. This is the property that actually went into the tax sale um, in 2000. This, this actually went into the tax sale in 2008, um, and then I got it out. I redeemed it in 2009. But basically, this is what the person who bid it on this property paid for, this property. They paid $2,100, and at that time, this property was worth eighty nine thousand um, after the market crash. So that was my silver lining that actually got me interested in researching the tax lien process. So, what exactly are tax liens? Tax lien is a word is that is used interchangeably. Most people use it uh, to represent both tax lien certificates and tax deeds. However, before we get before we get into the definition of tax lien certificates and tax deeds, let's review how and why they are created. So basically every county, and in some places it may be called a borough, a parish, or a district, has a local taxing authority. And those taxing authorities collect taxes on an annual or semi-annual basis. And so what are some of the things that um, the county use those taxes for? Why do we basically have to pay taxes? Well, we pay taxes for schools. We pay taxes for roads. We pay taxes for public utilities. We pay taxes for all those public service workers, police officers, firemen, teachers, engineers, doctors, lawyers, everybody who works for the government. They're paid through our taxes. We pay for libraries. We pay for um, court administration. We pay for public health. We pay for parks. So that's what why we pay property taxes. So. In paying those taxes, if you don't pay your property taxes, what happens? Basically, the county cannot function. And if the county can't function, 
then they can't provide those services. So what in each state the government has allowed, allowed the county to basically have a legal judgment to levy the property. And once they levy, levy the property, they can sell that property at auction. And in some places directly over the counter, over the Internet, and in some cases via mail. And so once the county takes takes the legal judgment or what is often called a FIFA, they record that in the deed records, and that is what creates what is known as a tax lien. And then those tax liens are then sold off. And so what you purchase is typically either a tax lien certificate or a tax deed. And so a tax a tax lien is basically an invisible lien that attaches to all properties in the United States. These liens are always present and considered superior liens. They take higher precedent over any other liens, including mortgages. And if they're not paid, that's when they become visible and move into first position. And then they give the holder of that lien, whether it's a tax lien certificate or tax deed, the ability to foreclose on the property. So some states have tax lien certificates, other states have tax deeds. The difference is the tax lien certificate is basically a proof of purchase. It's basically like a receipt, a piece of paper that entitles the bearer to interest upon redemption. The certificate itself does not give any interest rights or title rights to the property. However, in most cases, it can later convert into a, de a deed after foreclosure. Then there are states that have tax deeds. And a tax deed is just like um, other types of deed that give you um, title rights or property title rights. And so that is sold in exchange for the back taxes owed. And in most states, the purchaser would own the property outright. So. That's the difference. So you have a tax lien, which represents both tax lien certificates and tax deeds. And people use them pretty much interchangeably. And so when you're hearing people talk about tax lien investing, they could be talking about either tax lien certificates or tax deeds. And that's really just state specific. And so let's just take a look and you can see what, which one tax lien certificates or tax deeds are represented by your state. So you may notice that some states have what are called redeemable deeds. So a redeemable deed is basically a hybrid of the tax lien certificate and the tax deed. It's actually, you're actually issued a tax deed, however, the homeowner or really anybody else having um, an encumbrance or a lien on that property can redeem that deed. And so that's why they are called redeemable deeds. And then if that person does not redeem, then you can later foreclose on the property, and then it would act just like a regular deed. So at this point, do we have any questions? <laughs> well, Chantel, we did have a question. I don't know if you'll be able to answer this one. It's the Florida specific one. So it says, someone said, to the best of my knowledge, Pinellas County only offers tax certificates. So is there any way to purchase a tax deed? I don't know if that's something you can answer in general. Well, obviously, you can't probably not speak towards Pinellas County, Florida in particular, but um, if company, if, if states or counties offer tax certificates, can they also offer or purchase, can you purchase tax deeds as well? So Florida is a different type of state. It's really like a hybrid state. And so I don't really get into that too much because that's kind of like an advanced thing. But, yes, they offer both tax lien certificates. They offer tax deeds depending on what part of the process that tax lien certificate has gone through. Um, and then some of their tax lien certificates do convert into tax deeds. And so it varies by county in Florida. Okay, so we had another, really another question. Like okay. No, we had another good question pop up too. I'm sure this is something you're going to touch on, but yeah. um, says, someone says since tax liens are superior, 
what happens if you purchase a tax lien where there is a mortgage on the property? And again, this stuff you're going to cover. That's we'll just leave it alone right now. But if or if you want to answer it, <laughs> go ahead and do so. Right. As well. No, I can I can answer that. Um, that is the number one question that I get. And it's really hard for people to really wrap their mind around this, and it, and it holds a lot of people back from investing in tax liens. Um, since the tax lien is superior, and let me just explain why it's superior. The tax, the tax lien is superior because it attaches really to the land structure of the house. Oops, Chantel, you cut out there for a second. You still there? Yes, I'm here. Can you still okay, hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You went out just for a second. You can just really start over again. What you were okay. explaining on the tax superior tax liens. Sure. So most of us think that we really own our house, the structure, and the land, but really, um, the county is who owns the land. And so we own the land, but if we don't pay those property taxes, then the county comes in and they really own the land. And so what occurs is the county has a superior lien, and that superior lien will supersede any other lien, whether it's a mortgage, whether it's an IRS lien, whether it's a state tax lien, whether it's a mechanic lien. It really doesn't matter. It supersedes all liens. And so at some point in the process um, of the tax lien, um, if you have a tax lien certificate or a tax lien deed, at some point in the process, if you have to foreclose, you will foreclose on anyone that has a lien on the property. And so that could be a mortgage company. So you would actually foreclose on the mortgage company's right to redeem. And at that point, they would no longer be able to redeem, and that lien would be wiped off. And so, yes, it does supersede. And it's hard for people to believe and hard for people to understand, but that that is a fact. And so um, is that the last question, Scott? It is. There's another question there, but I'm going to leave it alone for right now. I think we're okay. I think you're going to talk about this in a minute. So go, go ahead. Okay. All right. So let's just quickly talk about um, liens. So um, tax liens pretty much – um, date back um, to the early 1800s in the U.S. Um, it's, it was the practice of selling land for back taxes old, and it was an adopted practice from England, who originally adopted from Rome, who ad originally adopted it from Egypt. Uh, the other countries also have this same form of land taxation, um, and then other things were also taxed as well, land, livestock, houses, um, and that is still exists today. Um, taxes were originally collected by tax administration administrators who collected taxes during harvest time. And if you notice, in most places in the United States, they're still collected around that time. I know here in Georgia, they're collected from August through December, and that's really around in in in. Um, this hemisphere, what most people consider harvest time. And so that's still the practice. So basically, who invests in tax liens? Basically, big banks invest in tax liens. And which big banks? The biggest of the big banks. Um, and they typically invest in these tax liens not in their own names, but they create basically hedge funds um, and different type of trusts to invest in tax liens. Um, outside of um, insurance, tax liens is the biggest investment for banks. And um, it was uh, J.P. Morgan who basically stated that there's literally $13.69 million made from tax liens on a daily basis. Not monthly, but daily. Like tax lien investing is literally a billion-dollar industry. And it's pretty much it has been a secret um, billion-dollar industry. So. Um, basically, 
since big banks are doing it, is now start is now time for just regular investors like you and I to start making money with uh, tax lien investing. And so um, I am going to put the slides up with your state again, and you can see basically how much money you can make from whatever state you're in. So I'm in Georgia, and so we basically make 20%. So if we either get the property, and if we don't get the property, we get 20% on our money. And I haven't yet found another place where I can get 20% on my money. So I love tax lien investing. And should tell that actually one of the questions that was asked, I think this would be a good time to address when we're talking about the rate. Somebody asked, they said they need to understand how companies make money when they end up bidding, say, a quarter of a percent for a tax lien certificate. So you saw hundreds of bids for tax liens at 0.25%. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe kind of explain why that happens and not every tax yeah. deed or tax certificate is the 18 or 20%. Right. Okay, so um, different states have different types of bidding practices. And so this is a little advanced, but I'd love to answer it. So let's say in Georgia, we have what's called a premium bid state. That means the highest bidder wins. However, in other states, they have what's called a bid down method. And so while in that state, let's say um, the interest rate that the state has um, assigned maybe 18%, when you get to auction, the bidders will bid down that interest rate. And then so the lowest bid would win. So like, you know, you may have, you start at 18%, then someone bids it down to 12%. And then somebody may bid it down to 1%. And then somebody may bid it down to a half a percent. And so this is done because a person would have done their research and they would have ascertained that it is likely that they're going to be able to get the property. And so they're willing to take that chance. And so that would equate to also um, in a premium bid state like Georgia, sometimes you may have a property that the back taxes owed may be $1,000, and that property may be worth 100000 And so you may think that you could get that property for maybe like 2000 but then somebody may bid that property up to 90000 and you're wondering, like, why would they do that? Well, sometimes people come to tax sale auctions and they're not investors. They're just someone who would actually live in that house, and so they would actually pay that amount. So there are, you know, different reasons why you may see, you know, um, a bidder bidding a property up or even bidding an interest rate down so low. You know, that, that property may be, um, um, close to its period where the redemption period has expired, meaning that um, it's getting ready to convert into an actual deed, and that person knows that there's a high chance that they could um, actually acquire the property. So that is one reason why. So I hope I answered that. <laughs> yeah, and Chantel, does I, am I correct? Well, I think sometimes the 0.25 or the, the really low on the, the that they have the bid down method. That also could be banks um, doing that for mortgages that they hold. The, the, maybe yes. somebody hasn't paid hasn't paid the bill, and so the bank wants to protect their mortgage by also buying the tax lien and doing it at the lowest interest possible to make sure they get it. Yes, yes. And then a lot of banks know, you know, they they may buy. Um, um, properties that they hold the mortgage on, and then they also buy properties that other banks hold the mortgage on as well. So, okay. and um, you know, um, I, you know, if you Google that, there's like a lot of different news stories about banks doing, you know, kind of shady business with that. But <laughs> I don't want to get in that too much. But you know, there's type of things that go go along with it. So, but um, yeah, so that yeah, we that have, could be another just, reason. Yeah, we have two questions on on this particular slide that we're on right now. Someone asked, uh, why do some states only get the deed? Does that mean zero interest? Or maybe just explain again why, for instance, Idaho and Kansas and Michigan and Minnesota are, are deed states as opposed to an interest rate on the on the er, what you earn. Right. So the the states that you see interest rates are on are tax lien certificate states or 
redeemable deed states. In the other states where you see the word deed, that means at the tax sale, once the tax the the bidder wins, they own the property. And so they don't get an interest. They just automatically get the property. And then in the states where it says it varies, the, in some states, some counties, the interest varies. And in some states, um, they may decide, some counties may be under tax lien certificates, and then other counties may be under tax lien deeds. In most states, the, 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 it's statewide, but in some states, they allow the county to choose what method would be best for them. Okay, good deal. Okay. Let me see if there's any other question. Um, somebody asked, if a person overbids on a property, the bid winner is, in, is entitled to the amount over the tax lien amount when they properly apply for it. Is that correct? So a person okay. overbids on the property, <laughs> the bid winner then is entitled to the amount over the tax lien amount. Okay. I'm not sure if the that... bid, right. So, okay, let me just restate that. So um, you have um, a back tax amount owed of $1,000. Let's say that property is bidded to 10000 So the question is, where does the $9,000 go? It does not go typically to the highest bidder. It actually goes to the original homeowner or anybody else having an interest in that property typically can apply for that overage. Um, if they do not apply, it typically will do what's called S cheat or go back to the state. So the state will um, be entitled to those funds if they're unclaimed after a specific amount of time. Um, there are only like three or four states, and forgive me, I do not know those states off the top of my head, but that don't do that. They just keep the overage fund. States will allow the original homeowner or, you know, like if it was a mortgage company on it, the mortgage company can apply for those funds as well. So that's typically what happens to those funds. Okay. Then I'll, um, I'll, that's that's good. We have a couple of questions. We'll just uh, I'll keep those in the bag for now. We'll we'll get to those in a minute. But go go ahead. Okay. Well, now I'm moving specifically into tax deeds in Georgia. That's what I specialize in. <laughs> so that's what uh, I'm going to talk about here. So um, tax liens. What type of tax liens are issued in Georgia? Georgia has what's known as redeemable tax deeds. And so we talked about that a little bit, but I'll just go over it quickly again. They are a hybrid of tax lien certificates and tax deeds. And so the, the, you're actually issued a tax deed. So you do have a deed to the property. However, when you're first issued that tax deed, unlike regular deeds, they do not give you immediate legal ownership to the property. So typically um, in Georgia, you would have to wait one year and then you could begin a foreclosure process on the owner's right to redeem. And then after that is done, then you would have ownership to the property. Um, and at that time, you would not have a marketable interest, but you would have like physical rights to the property and to get a marketable interest. And a marketable interest is just an interest meaning that you can sell the property um, and acquire title insurance with that sale, you would have to do a, what's known as a quiet title. And so the difference between, the other difference between a tax lien certificate and a redeemable deed is that on a tax lien certificate, you're receiving interest, um, an annual percentage rate, whereas on a redeemable deed, there's actual uh, interest penalty, and so that it's a simple interest. And so whether a person pays day one or day 365, you're entitled to the full 20%, whereas in some states that has a tax lien certificate, the interest rate is compounded um, or um, calculated on a monthly basis. So in a state that would have 12%, that means that you're making 1% uh, per month. And so if they redeemed in the six months, then you would actually earn a 6% annual percentage rate. Um, and so where on redeemable deeds, you just get a flat um, tax penalty. 
And then also in, in, in Georgia, um, on redeemable deeds, when the owner actually redeems, they have to deal with the tax lien investor versus in tax lien certificate states, typically they go back to the county, make the payment, the county contacts the tax lien investor, and everything is done through the county. Um, but here in Georgia, we do things a little bit differently. <laughs> so the actual person, if they wanted to redeem, they would be actually contacting you, the investor. So, um, and I think we are at a question break. <laughs> yeah, good. That's no, perfect. We have a couple coming in. Um, so this might be going back a little bit in the presentation, but someone said, in, okay. so in theory, a person that has a tax lien can remove the house from the property and retain the real property, correct? Is that correct? Or is the tax lien on the actual dirt underneath? The tax lien is on the land and any parcel attached to the land. So typically um, in most counties they have what's called parcel ID. And so the parcel ID would state, it would show you what is actually um, what the tax lien is actually attaching to. Because then, like, somebody may own a house in, on one plot of land, and then they may have another plot of land attached. And so sometimes when you're researching, you may find that the tax lien certificate may only be at attached to the plot of land. It may not be attached to the actual um, plot with the house. And so that that is determined by doing your due diligence. But yes, it can be attached to both a, the piece of land and the house. Tax lien certificates can attach to any property. So, All right. Um, and, and again, I think this was again going back to the question we had when we were, we were talking about someone buying a tax lien and the tax lien being superior to a mortgage. <laughs> that if you take that tax lien to kind of through the process of a foreclosure, does the mortgage just go away then that's on that property if a bank doesn't fight it? Yes. Okay. That's the sweet answer to that is yes. So um, <clears throat> basically once you – it's just like um, if a person is – if they own a property and they have a mortgage on it, they don't pay their mortgage – and then the mortgage company goes through a foreclosure process. The mortgage company is basically removing that person's right through the foreclosure process. And so when you go through the foreclosure process with tax liens, you're also removing the mortgage company's right. And so, yes, um, it does remove it. And so that's typically why... In many cases, in the majority of cases, you will see that mortgage companies um, will pay the taxes if the homeowner does not pay the taxes because they know that they can lose their superior position if the taxes are not paid. And that's why um, most mortgage companies um, require escrows, and if they don't, they also require that um, the tax commissioner in that county contact them if, in fact, the taxes have not been paid because they know they will lose their superior position. So, yes. Yeah, and someone, another, another question. Someone said a tax lien expert they talked to, I guess, had mentioned that even if you bid, say, in the states where you bid down, some states still pay a minimum of 5%. Is the, do you know if there's any truth to that or not? Um, I can't really speak, uh, you know, the, I don't have like specific knowledge on the top of my head of all states, but that the, I'm sure it, that could be the case because every state kind of makes their own laws when it pertains to that. And so um, off the top of my head, I know some of the northeastern states do have um, some type of minimum requirement. Um, that they will um, institute. And so even if it does get bid down to that amount, you'll still mm -hmm. get that minimum rate. But I don't know which state um, that may be. Yeah, and I just I have a couple of – there's two people asking questions I think similarly is kind of the bidding process. Um, I don't know if you're going to talk about that here in a minute or not, but someone said, do you need to bid in person or can this be done online? I know from experience handling – some IRA transactions. I think some counties uh, are in person, and I think some of them do have an online process, and therefore you probably could bid for properties outside your own state if, if that county has uh, an online auction. 
Um, someone also asked if do you need any type of license to participate in the bidding for properties at, at a tax lien auction? So um, all those questions usually lead me to the same answer, which is when you're doing um, tax lien investing, you should become intimately connected with the county office. Like you should know, begin to know the names of the people there. You should know the number by heart or have it locked in your phone because you're going to be calling with these questions because every county is different. So in, in some counties, they may require you to register. I've never heard of a county that um, you would have to have a license, but some counties require you to register. Some counties you can just show up. You know, some counties have online auctions. Some counties have only in person. Some some counties do um, bidding inside. And here in Georgia, they do everything outside on the courthouse steps. So the the bottom line is, when I'm teaching people, the very first thing that you should be doing is calling the county and saying, you know, where can I find information about your process? Typically, you can find that on the county's website, but there's still small counties that may not have a website or you know, they just may not have all the information on the website, but you can call. And just really be nice to the county employees, and they'll, they'll you know, give you a wealth of information. But really every county, even in the same state, counties are different. Like here in Georgia, some counties accept credit cards. In the major area, none of them accept credit cards. And so it's just a little bit different when it comes to the actual process. And so that's something that you, any county that you're going to be bidding in, you just want to call and, and, and try to ascertain all that information. Okay, and actually somebody had a question on, and specifically you were just talking about the, you know, the Georgia, Georgia process. Someone just want to know if, if the property auctions are held outside the courthouse or where the, where the, where kind of where they do the property auction, is it generally the same place? And they're asking specifically if you know about Gwinnett in Hall counties, if it's kind of actually inside the courthouse where the property auctions take place, or is it somewhere different? Okay, so in Georgia, by law, uh, by statute, they have to hold the property uh, sales outside on the courthouse steps. It's a public outcry, and so it's that's where it's done legally. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, why don't we? Uh, why we got? We still have some questions coming in. So let's let's continue. I want to make sure we get through the presentation at least. Uh, here in the next few minutes, and then we'll, we can certainly do some more time for questions as we go at the end. Okay. Well, yeah, we're almost at the end. So, all right. Well, why tax lien investing? One, it helps the local counties to keep their funds so they can function. And two, one thing that a lot of people don't consider is that it does actually give the homeowner more time um, because um, in a lot of places, if, if it wasn't for a tax sale, the county would have to imme immediately foreclose on the property just how a bank does and take it that way and then resell it to gain their funds. And so it typically gives the homeowner more time. The other biggest reason, and I think that this doesn't resonate with a lot of people because most, most people don't understand owning real estate free and clear. And even as myself, when I began to own real estate free and clear, it just never really struck me until maybe a year or two later, like, I actually own this piece of property free and clear, and I actually have way more options than if I had a mortgage on it. And um, owning real estate free and clear also was just a small upfront investment in comparison to what it typically takes to own real estate. So that's what tax lien investing can do. Um, and if we talk about owning real estate free and clear, what can it actually do for you? Like I just did off the top of my head, you know, I, I have a the same property that I showed you that went into the tax sale. I redeemed that property, and so now I still have control of that property. But what it does is, like, that property, I could literally rent that property out for about $1,300 a month. It's a four-bedroom, two-and-a-half bath. And I have a tenant that has been uh, a loyal tenant. She's been in that property since I retrieved it back. And her, more, her rent is $825 a month. And so, you know, I could raise it, but I also have the option not to because I own that property free and clear, you know, versus – when I had mortgages, I had to, like, kind of go with what was going on with my mortgage. And so now, I, you know, I, I prefer to keep loyal tenants, you know, 
Um, and so that's one thing. But it, it can do so many other things for you. You can leverage those properties to buy more properties. You can, you know, um, take a mortgage out on it and get other properties. You know, and then you can really sell it too if you wanted to. So, um, but basically, the biggest thing that it allowed me to do is that it allowed me to retire, you know, from my corporate job. And in the case of tax liens, not have to go back into corporate America. And so, you know, when you're cash flowing um, and your cash flow is pretty clear, free and clear outside of your, you know, things that you're going to have to pay anyway, taxes, insurance, repairs, and, you know, vacancy rate. And really, I typically don't have vacancy rate. As you can see, somebody's paying 800 and twenty five dollars for a thirteen hundred a month house, they're gonna, you know, pretty much stay there. And so I don't really have a vacancy rate um on any of my properties. <laughs> so um but basically you could just calculate like how many properties free and clear would it take for you to be able to retire. I told you I was making forty thousand. Like I easily replaced that in and doubled it. So I mean it just depends on your lifestyle but that's what owning tax lien properties can do for you. So, um, and then what is the biggest impediment that most people have to getting started? Usually it's money, you know, and with tax lien investment, all you have to do is figure out what is the maximum amount you can afford. And I'm sure for a lot of people, you could probably get a property. You know, I just like I told you, I was at the tax sale um, yesterday. I think, let me see, the lowest property that I purchased was for like $3,900 yesterday. And that property is worth about $60,000 right now. So, um, you know, you could save up to $3,900 if you didn't have it. And if you have an IRA, then definitely I'm sure that you have that type. You can afford that type of investment. So, so. Just want to run through this process really quick so that you understand it. So Divine Homeowner failed to pay his taxes in any county, Georgia, by December 31st, 2016. So then on January 1st, 2017, by law, the county had to place a FIFA or legal judgment to levy upon that property. So once that judgment was attached, meaning it was recorded in the county records, it becomes a tax lien against the property, and now the county has the right to sell the property. So on the first Tuesday in June, and in Georgia, it could be any time April through December, because in Georgia we don't have tax sales by law, January, February, or March. So um, the first Tuesday in June, the county decides to sell. Um, Divine homeowner tax deed. Yes, Chantel, you're cut out there for a second. If you could just go, uh, just start again with uh, about, about him, his tax lien being sold. Okay, so on the first Tuesday of June, Divine home, homeowner's tax, tax levy was auctioned off, and Hatasha High Bidder was issued the tax deed which is a lien against the property, a tax lien. Tasha High Bidder paid $1,000 for that tax deed. Now, the Vine homeowner can redeem the tax deed at any point up until Tasha High Bidder forecloses on his right to redeem. And Tasha High Bidder cannot start that foreclosure process for 365 days or until June 7, 2018. Now, if Divine Homeowner redeems at any time before that time, he must pay Tasha High Bidder her original $1,000 that she paid plus 20% for a total of $1,200. If Divine Homeowner does not redeem at any time before June 6, Tasha High Bidder can start the foreclosure process. Um, if, she starts, if she starts the, the foreclosure process, and completes it, which usually takes 45 to 90 days, then she can take physical possession of the property. If Tasha Hybrid wants to sell the house, she can do so at that point, but she can only do so via the tax deed or a quick claim deed. She cannot 
sell the property via warranty deed. She must first quiet the title if she wants to do that. And Chantel, I actually had a question. Do you know how roughly just an estimate of how somebody asked how long a quiet title action, they asked how much the foreclosure, which you can say typically 45, 90 days, but uh, what about the quiet title action? The quiet title action is usually a three to four month process. And it could extend out into years if it's actually challenged. But typically, um, I've never had one to be challenged, so it usually takes about three to three to four months to complete. So, um, on this investment, Tasha will receive either her initial investment plus twenty percent, or she will receive the tax deed to the property, which would give her physical rights to the property. So, any other questions? Oh, we got a bunch, <laughs> so it's <we're> just good. <laughs> so we'll just start and see what see what we can get through here. Um, I maybe talk about somebody was asking about well, they asked about the timelines. Now, I guess not only about the foreclosure process, but um, two individuals kind of the same question. What kind of due diligence do you do up front? Um, and then talk about the timeline of kind of maybe how far in advance you start doing research on properties you want to bid on. Okay, so um, how far in advance? really depends on a person's strategy. The, the county has to, by law, um, run notices of these properties in uh, Oregon at least a month ahead of time. And most counties publish um, the list on their website, or you can get the list from the county. So the list may start at, like this particular tax sale, the list started out at 583 properties. By the time we got to auction, there was about 149 properties. So you could, there's a lot of fall off because people are coming in paying their taxes. So you can start at the beginning of the month if you wanted to, but then you would have done due diligence on about 400 properties if you do due diligence on them all. Um, I happen to do due diligence on all the properties um, just so that I can have options while I'm at the tax sale, where someone else who may only do due diligence on 10, if those 10 are then, you know, they don't have any options at the tax sale. However, I typically start my due diligence process about two weeks out that I've gotten a lot of drop-off, but then I'm not waiting to the very last minute to where I could get caught not having done the due diligence on some properties that I could um, obtain. So what due diligence is, um, primarily the number one thing that I want to do is actually go see the property because I want to make sure that that property is there. You know, I can pull it up on Google, but it may, you know, it may show me a house on Google, but by the time I get to it, it may show me a building that's been burnt down. So that's the number one thing. I want to lay eyes on it. I want to make sure if it's an um, actual um, house or it's a land lot, you know, because anything can go into the tax sale auction. It could be a commercial business, a house. It could be some land, you know, anything that the, the county taxes can go in that sale. So I just want to make sure what, that I'm looking at it. One question I always get is, do I look at the liens on the house? No, because there's no reason to look at the liens. They're going to all be wiped off, or one of those people holding the lien is going to pay me my money plus 20%. So I could care less what lien is on the house. Um, but I do, and, and this will depend on your business model. Are you a buy and holder? You know, are you going to rent these properties out? Do you want to flip? You know, so those are going to determine what your due diligence is. But, you know, primarily you want to know what it is you're buying. And so you want to go look at the property. I never bid on a property that I have not laid eyes on or that my team has not laid eyes on. And so that's the type of due diligence that um, we typically do. Um, well, somebody asked too. I guess a good, good question. I think for somebody maybe getting looking to get started, are there any f hidden fees that you were surprised by when you started acquiring some of your tax liens or deeds, either at the, uh, maybe the upfront process or in the foreclosure, you know, quiet title process? Right. Anything so hidden? when I started, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was gonna say yeah. Any any hidden fees? 
Okay. So when I started, I didn't have anyone to teach me about tax lien. There were no court tax lien courses, you know, nobody doing things on tax lien. So yeah, everything was hidden to me. So when I first started, I didn't even know that there, you know, I knew about the foreclosure process, but I didn't know that, you know, I didn't know how much it would cost. I, I knew, I didn't even know about the quiet title process. So that was, you know, something that was kind of hidden. But this, as the, the, the things that I'm telling you that you have to pay for is pretty much, you know, it. Like, you know, the you're going to have to spend some money doing the due diligence. So that's going to cost you gas and, you know, time or whatever. And then, um, you know, the bid amount. And then you're going to uh, – one thing that may be a surprise to people is that you're going to be responsible for keeping that property up to code and you're going to – you're going to want to protect your position, so you're going to want to pay the upcoming taxes, you know, because if you're holding it for a year, typically you're going to run into a time frame where the taxes are going to become due again, and so you're going to want to pay those taxes to protect your position, because if you don't, someone, if it goes into a tax sale, someone can come and also have an additional tax lien on yeah, and, and actually, um, Chantel, we had that question. That was going to be my next question. What happens if you have two situations with two different people owning tax liens on two different years? So whoever owns the first tax lien is going to have a superior position uh, over the second person. And then if they don't exercise their foreclosure right, and then the second lien holder um, comes up on their time, then they can, you know, foreclose and supersede, but they'll still have to pay the original person. So either way, you won't lose your money or your percentage is, is the bottom line. You just may lose your position in terms of being able to um, physically possess the property. Right, but, but, you don't get any kind of, keep, but you don't get any kind of right of first refusal or anything. It's just next year, if those that taxes aren't paid, whoever is the bidder, highest bidder is going to win, correct? Yes. But you you can you can you can in fact create your own first right of refusal by paying the taxes, and that's why I mean you should protect your investment because right. then it won't even go into the tax bill. So that's what I teach all my students. Like you know, this is something that you're going to have to do anyway. So you just want to go ahead and you know calculate that I'm going to have to pay the taxes. Okay. Uh, good. Another good question. I think came up. What can you can you do anything with the property in the first 365 days? You mentioned that you know, there's a year long period before you can start that foreclosure process. Uh, I'm assuming you can't rent it out. You can't evict the owner because you don't really have title yet to the property. Um, is there anything else you can do in that first time other than maybe paying any other delinquent tax bills? No, you cannot do anything to the actual property. You can, however, in most states. You can sell, assign, or transfer your tax deed or tax lien certificate. So you can flip that if you wanted to. Yep. Um, I had a, a couple of people ask questions about buying in an IRA. I can answer this question. Um, you can, typically, buying in an IRA is done in, in a couple of different ways. Either you can contact us uh, in advance, and we can get you uh, a number of cashier's checks to take with you to the auction. Um, to, to bid on bid on the properties and use the cashier's checks to pay for them, and you re, you return any unused cashier's checks uh, at the at the end of the day the, that you don't use. But I would say more commonly, um, you know, the two other ways too we see the people buying an account in an online auction. We can help you set up your online bidding account uh, in the name of your IRA account and actually submit funds on your behalf directly through your online account. I've done that a few times. Uh, but a lot of people do utilize, and I, I did include, I did not include the slides today, but utilize an LLC uh, or a private trust that your IRA uh, opens and creates its own kind of checkbook control LLC. We do a lot of webinars on that topic. Uh, but then doing it in that fashion gives you the ability to move your IRA funds out of the IRA with Advana into this LLC bank account. Now, if you control that LLC bank account, you would buy the tax liens at auction in the name of your LLC and simply move money out of that account uh, to purchase them. That tends to be a lot of times the more common way we see it because tax liens, you know, like said, Chantel was saying, you're, she's bidding here on you know, yesterday and even this morning and, and getting things done. It's a pretty quick turnaround that they need the funds. So 
the LLC typically is a uh, a better way to do it. Um, a couple well, a couple more questions, Chantel. You have time for a few more? Sure. Um, yeah, um, I'm here. Okay, yeah. Someone asked, what is the largest risk of investing in a tax lien? So the biggest risk investing in tax lien is if you do not do your due diligence. So you end up with a piece of property that you really can't do anything with. Like, um, you know, uh, sometimes there are – lots of land that are actually landlocked. Like you, you don't even have an easement to get to that piece of land, so there's really nothing you can do for it. And I see people bidding on those because they have not done their due diligence. Or like I said, sometimes there may be a lot that's considered what's considered a rear lot, and a person may have gone to that property and thought that it was the actual house, but it's not. It's the rear lot. And so you may end up with a piece of property that, Nobody's going to redeem that property, and you're not going to be able to do anything with it. And that only comes if you are not in your due diligence. And even then, um, you know, I've learned a strategy to get out of those as well. So um, even then, you can still come out a big winner. So um, that is the biggest risk, though. Yeah, I was going to say, because someone, another question, somebody said, if you if you buy the tax lien, like, for instance, if the if the, if the the tax lien holder wants to, is there any way to, to prevent the homeowner from trashing the house, burning it down to whatever? Is there anything, you know, does the homeowner ever threaten the tax lien owner, which I guess they may not even know who that is, but um, is there anything you can do if someone else asked even like, do you have, should you, if the homeowner moves out, should you be paying, as a tax lien owner, should be paying, you know, utilities, any other upkeep on the property? So, um one this thing I always due, encourage, this is part of all the due diligence that you do, basically. Yes. So one of the things that I do and I teach my students to do is um, once I acquire a tax lien property, I immediately insure it, for one. And then it's just like any other investment. There's, there's no way to guarantee that someone's going to not trash the property. But in my 10 years in investing, I've never had that. The more likelihood is that I've just bought properties that are already been trashed because you have to remember I'm buying these properties for pennies on the dollar. So, you know, I may have to put thirty or $40,000 of rehab and still, you know, the, the after repair value is still, you know, pretty huge. And so, um you know that's just a, a risk that I typically take. A lot of times I don't, I don't prefer to buy properties with um, people still in them because there's a, a, a likelihood of them redeeming. I prefer vacant properties, but I have bought properties. I bought a property yesterday that has a person in it just because I, you know, that was um, what I could get at that particular sale. So. Um, but, yeah, I've never had that actually happen. A lot of times people do worry about, like, the worst-case scenario, but just in my um, 10 years of experience, I've never had somebody trash the, trash the property. A lot of times by the time, um, a lot of times these houses are um, going into the tax sale, a lot of times the people already kind of know what's coming, like, because they're usually either in foreclosure you know, and they're just kind of trying to buy some time, and they, you know, maybe have done some research. They know that they have that year period. But, you know, and, and, and they may take, like, um, the appliances, you know, I mean, any attached appliances, or they may, you know, take a, um, a AC system, you know, something like that. But I've never just had somebody just totally trash the property. Um, Chantel, I think we we had a few other questions. I think we're just run, we've run out of time for a lot of them. I really appreciate you answering. We we answered a ton of questions, and I think got a lot of people um, some good information. Um, obviously, on this last slide, you have a boot camp coming up. Maybe tell us a little bit about that uh, coming up here in a month or so. Yeah. So uh, just want to mention, I saw someone asking about my website. So I just wanted to mention that I don't have a website yet. I am mostly a tax to um, teaching, so I don't have a website. But if you want to register for this boot camp, it's a I do one day and two day boot camps. Um, this is a one day because it's online. This is an online seminar. You can go to that Eventbrite um, page right there listed and register. We do have a um, early bird special for ninety seven dollars, and then we've also added an additional discount for. Um, 
people coming from Advanta. So if you just type in Advanta when you're checking out, it will give you an additional $10, um, and that's for the first 50 people. So, um, And that is on Saturday, December 9th from 9 to 5, and we're going to pretty much cover all of those questions because keep in mind, this was just an hour introduction. So you can learn everything you need to know. I have, I have um, some new students that just sent me an email saying that they got their first property. You know, I saw one of my students got a property, and I was like, oh, my goodness, I wish I would have known about that sale. <laughs> so they are doing big things. And so if you want to learn um, after taking this course, you will have um, in-depth knowledge on how to invest. Now, this is for Georgia because that's what I specialize in. So if you're looking for, like, Florida or Texas, means go ahead and register and you're going to and I thank you for having me. <laughs> yep, Chantel, yeah, thank we, we appreciate you being on. And again, if anyone has, you know, questions or whatever, go to the website, go to sign up for the the boot camp. Um, or as we said at the beginning, if you want a copy of these slides, um, you know, it was 101 slides at ga tax lien bootcamp uh, dot com. So um, just make sure you go there, email Chantel for the slides. Um, and again, Chantel, thank you very much for being on. Um, and I do see people just saying, I guess, maybe check, uh, Chantel, if you can, check the Eventbrite site. Some people saying they're, they went to that link and there's maybe an issue on the link. So just uh, maybe make sure that's good. But um, just check back there again if you're interested in the webinar. Again, Chantel, thank you very much uh, for your time today. Okay. Thank you.